And so wasn't it, uh, I guess, maybe Mr. Red Foley who urged you to come to Nashville, or, or he was one of the first ones? Yeah, mostly it was Red Savine, but they were together. They want to show up there, but Red Savine was the key man that uh, that uh, really was completely responsible. But they both were together when they first met me and heard me. They were the first that, that heard me sing. And so uh, what year did you arrive in Nashville? Well, I... I went by uh, about 63, 64, and uh, I stopped off, and, and uh, uh, I was given some songs by uh, uh, a guy. Uh, uh, when, I, when, when, when they told me, when Red Savine told me to go to Nashville, I, I stopped by after I was going down to spring training. I went to spring training with the, uh, in 61, I went to spring training with the Angels. Then I hurt my, they ran over my leg and broke it up in Montana, uh, working at a smelter there. And I was, you see, remember, if you remember baseball, the, uh, Los Angeles Angels, uh, they, when they expanded, they were the first team expanded in the American League. Oh, okay. And, and, and the next, the next following year in 62, it was the Mets. So I went to spring training with the Angels, but my arm, I had hurt my arm in 56. I cracked my elbow, and I didn't have that 90-mile-hour fastball, 90-plus fastball. And uh, so I, they looked at me and everything, but they told me they didn't think I had the major league arm, so they sent me home. And But I sent all of my clippings and all of my uh, my accomplishments to, 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 the, to the Mets, you know. And, uh, of course, uh, uh, Casey Stingle wouldn't look at me. And, <laughs> so, but uh Rich of mine they told me to go by Nashville uh, uh, when they heard me up in Montana so what I did after uh, Stingle wouldn't look at, look at me or give me a chance I, I flew back uh, I mean actually back through Nashville and went to where Red of mine told me to go and after that led to Jack Johnson my, ended up being my first and only manager and then Jack Clement, my producer. That's from there to all of the songs you've heard, and and uh, from then that from that time to now, that's where it all happened. RCA, they signed me '66, and that's where. It... And so, so Jack uh, recorded a, a couple of, uh, I guess you would call them demo demo recordings for you. Yeah, Jack Johnson. Uh, uh, what they did, they gave me seven songs and. Uh, uh, this was after though. This is when I came back the second year on my vacation. Uh, see, uh, this is about about this is I think like sixty four, and uh, uh, sixty five rather. And they gave me seven songs, and I went down to to work up, you know, and learn them and and send them back to Nashville. I didn't send them back. I took them back. And then they took me up to Jack Clements, and I say they, Jack Johnson took me up to Jack Clements' office, and Jack Clements asked me to sing after I worked him up, and he, he said, and he said to Jack Johnson, he said, Jack, I think he's ready to record. He says, uh, could you do three songs and uh, uh, two songs in an hour? I mean, in three hours? I, said, I can do it now. <laughs> <laughs> I had never been in a recording studio, but once, recording studio, but once. But anyway. We cut that demo over Snake Scarlet Night and Atlantic Coastline, and Chet Atkins took it to RCA, and they signed me in September of uh, of '65. And then they got they got the, the radio stations got my record uh, in 1966, January of '66, and that's been ever since then. It's been that's you just look at my accomplishments all the way from that to now. And so your first. Uh... Your first single that was released was The Snake's Crawl at Night, correct? That's, that's correct. And uh, by your third single, which was Just Between You and Me, which we heard earlier, that went yeah, pretty... Yeah, well, that, that was the one I wanted. Of the, that was one of the seven that I was given. And that's the one I wanted for my first single. But Jack Clement said, no, we're not going to sing that out. He didn't want me singing no love songs at that point in my career. He said, we're going to sing, or you're just going to sing about... A cheating wife and uh, and it's a good cut. It's a good song. will get you going. So uh, I like Snake Crawler. And I just didn't. I I didn't like the, the what the 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 story was telling. Like I did just between you and me. But ended up that's what most of my fans like me singing is, is love songs. So it was just uh, you know I was so unique they didn't want to stop me singing love songs at all. 
and uh, just between you and me went right to the top of the charts pretty right. much. And uh, well, see, that's what I did, uh, Paul. I, what I did, I, I used that song as a measuring stick because uh, of all the seven they gave me, that's the one I said uh, that I wanted to do, uh, be my first single, right? Mm-hmm. Okay, so it was my third single, and it ended up to number nine. Went to number nine in the, in, in, on the charts. And it was nominated for an Oscar. I mean, nominated for a Grammy. So, so, so the thing here is, I said, okay, from now on, what I'll do, if somebody present me with a song, I'm going to level with myself. And I do, I really like this song. And that's the way I've done all my career. So it seemed like when I did it that way, my fans, like, if, by doing it that way, my fans seem to like it. It worked out real fine. Well, you sure have a great judge of material. In 1969, you released uh, All I Have to Offer You is me, and I believe that became your first number one record, yeah, correct? That, that, was, that was my first number one single, yeah. And you went on to have 36 more number one country singles, so you had a very, 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 and, and still do, I'm sure, a great judge of material. Well, I, it, it, now I have to admit, though, Paul, it, at the very beginning, um, Jack Clement picked most of my material, and there were some songs that I didn't like as much as others, but I won't mention them because they probably... <laughs> They all turned out to be pretty good. Uh, in other words, uh, I, I didn't have but one million-selling single, but I had uh, a, a lot of million-selling albums. So, so, but and the reason I feel that way is because Jack Clement said we were gonna if we got a B song, we'd make it an A song. We try to make it an A song. We got an A song, we try to make it a double A song. I mean, we like to think that everything that we cut would be a single, and that that was our philosophy. And I, and I think in doing that, uh, with that philosophy, I think that's why we sold so many albums. Yeah, because uh, I guess it was pretty, uh, I, I guess, regular at the time that they would, most artists would release an album with a couple of their hit singles and then just some other correct. filler songs that that's weren't correct. overly they, great. They, they, that's correct. They, he said, we're not going to go, like, Kids and Angel Good Morning was my big, uh, biggest million seller, but he said, we're not just going to take Kiss an Angel and then throw a little bigger do around and say just a half good look, half a song, a good, pretty good song. Like we're going to, we're going to pick the best, we can the best of the best. And, uh, in fact, Jack used to tell me, he said, one time he came up to me, he says, Charlie, the songs and the, the songs we're recording now, he said, 50 years from now, they're going to be playing. And I'm telling you, it's getting pretty close to it. And, <laughs> and we're still playing them. Yeah. He said, they're going to be liking them and they're going to be playing them. I said, well, I looked at him, you know, I didn't say no, but, uh, and of course he did tell me something else. He said, one day we might be, you know, playing and singing and got across the the, uh, the universe. <laughs> so he, he's that kind of guy, you know. He, yeah. Most, pe- 